Now, if you are a Christian for even just a few uh, weeks, months, maybe years, at some point in your Christian journey, I'm sure that you would have come to a point in your life where some doubts would come crashing in. Whether it's doubts about God, doubts about God's goodness or his plan for you, or even of his existence. So whether you've been a follower of Jesus all your life, or whether it's something you're exploring even now about who God is. You might have even studied theology at a really deep level. But doubts about God can hit you at any time. I can remember a few years ago, uh, I was traveling through Rwanda, and we had some time to stop in Kigali and go to what was called the Genocide Remembrance Memorial. And... um, This is a place where 250,000 bodies are placed. You know, in 1994, over the space of just a few months, uh, one million people were killed in Rwanda. And I can remember in this place standing in front of uh, an exhibition uh, which was particularly looking at the children who were involved in this. Uh, And the stories were of those many children who were hacked to death. And some of the murders took place in churches. And even some of the murders committed by those who professed to be Christians. And as I stood in this room and looked and was affected by what I saw, I was saying, Lord God, where were you in this genocide? Where were you in these times? And that question can be repeated throughout the world as we look around today. Where are you, God, in Ukraine or Sudan? Why do you allow such suffering? And we can doubt the goodness of God when we see such large-scale suffering, but also when we bring it down closer to home for our own lives. Doubts can surface. Maybe it's over health, an ongoing health issue. Or someone you know has faced a horrendous cancer situation. It might be yourself or someone you love. It might be the breakdown of a relationship. Your spouse walks out on you. You experience the pain of abuse. Or it's just that life doesn't pan out as you would expect or hope it would. Your career seems to have stalled. Your exams don't turn out as you hoped they would. Maybe you've looked around even within the church and you've seen some leaders who you had on a pedestal have fallen and not met the standards we would hope. Or you just wonder, God, are you there? Are you there? And doubts can grow in our minds, where maybe you feel as if your prayers hit the ceiling and come back down to you without being answered. Now, although that's something we recognize as around us, we live in a culture, particularly in the West, in the UK, in the Western world, Western Europe particularly, where we see around us a decline in Christian faith. You see, more recently, that less than half the population now describe themselves as Christians. And alongside that, you've got a strident group of new atheists, such as Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, and the late Christopher Hitchens. And their striking argument is not so much new, but they would be saying that religion actually poisons everything. One of them say, we can think of absolutely nothing good that religion has ever produced in the history of mankind. Tom Wright, the Anglican bishop, when referring to these uh, new atheists, who is a, he's the first-rate Bible scholar, he said, part of the anger of new atheists springs from a huge disappointment because they predicted the collapse of religion across the world, and it has not happened. Indeed, as you look at the wider world, reading through the Guardian newspaper, which is not particularly known to be pro-Christian, Uh, In an article in 2018, it said, Religion, why faith is becoming more and more popular, said this. It said, if you think religion belongs to the past and we live in a new age of reason, you need to check the facts. 84% of the world's population identifies with a Christian, with a religious group. And that's that's not just a matter of the developed world only. There was a survey of 3,000 science, medical, and engineering professionals in the UK, Germany, and France. 
And they found that of that group, 25% were atheists. But 45% described themselves as religious or spiritual. There are many scientists who have a strong faith. So as we look at this question of doubt, it's not just a straightforward science versus others and religion. So as we open up what it looks over this coming month, the issue of doubt, uh, and we look at that today, we're looking at doubting God's existence, doubting God's existence. So as we do that, I'm going to pause and invite God's presence as we pray together, as we open that reading we had from Romans. So let's pause and pray. Father, thank you that there is nothing new in this world as we read scripture from 2,000 years ago and we face maybe different issues today. You are still the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know our hearts, you know our doubts, and you know our fears. And I pray this morning you would speak to every single person here, those searching, those who are unsure, And those of us who sometimes have those doubts that niggle, come by your spirit, I pray. Speak to each one of us. Amen. So we're looking through this month on doubt, but what actually does doubt mean? What's the meaning of doubt? Well, the root word of doubt comes from dubitare, which is the Latin word for two. It means two. Uh, To doubt is to be split into two. It's double-minded. So if you believe, you are single-minded. You accept something as true. Or if you disbelieve, you have one mind. You disbelieve it's true. But to doubt is to waver between two different things. You're unsure. You're in two minds, a foot in two camps. In the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah said to the Israelites on Mount Carmel, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? In the Gospels, when Jesus meets a man who brings a son to him who's having seizures and has demonic oppression in his life, he brings him to Jesus and says, Jesus, can you heal my son? And Jesus says to him, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. How many of us might resonate with that? And for many people, we get troubled by the fact that we do have doubts in the first place. When doubts come along, we say, what's the matter with me? I'm sitting here in this church, and I feel these doubts that are coming over me. I want to follow Jesus, but there's this doubt about this and about the other. Why do I feel like this? There's a big issue that's hit you or your family. And we beat ourselves up, and we think we must be a useless Christian if we have any doubts at all. You know, when I was in my last year of primary school, just a few years ago, in Wickham, (laughs) I had a teacher who was a teacher particularly of French, and I really didn't like him, or his teaching style. I don't think he liked me very much either. Because his way of teaching was to shout and to bully and to throw chalk if you weren't listening. And I can remember him saying to me, dust, you're useless at French. You'll never be any good at it. I don't know why you bother. And for many of us, when we approach this subject and we talk about doubt and faith, we say to ourselves, you're no good at this. Why do you even bother? You should give up. You're useless. But I want to say really clearly at the beginning of this series that having faith does not mean that you'll never have doubts. Faith is not the absence of doubt, any more than courage is the absence of fear. See, a courageous soldier bravely goes into battle, but he still will have fear. But the courageous soldier is not dominated by his fears. He brings his fears under control, and he moves forward with courage in spite of that fear. So if you're a person who believes, it doesn't mean that you'll never have questions, you'll never have doubts, but you won't be controlled by those doubts. You're able to move forward in faith. 
And as we look at doubt and maybe we talk to people who question us and our Christian faith, the question often comes across, well, where's your certainty? Where's your evidence? Where's your proof? And we may be challenged by someone to give me an airtight, watertight proof about God and his existence, and then I'll believe you. We can be uncertain. If we think about it in life, though, there are very few things that you can prove with absolute certainty. So, for instance, you cannot prove with absolute mathematical certainty that the pilot flying your plane is properly trained or hasn't been drinking. And he knows how to take off and to land the plane. You can't prove it mathematically, but you trust yourself into that person's hands. Or say you're going in for a surgery. You cannot prove with absolute certainty that the surgeon has been properly trained, has the right equipment, and won't sell your body parts at the end of that time. But we put our hands into the hands of that surgeon. So there are many things we cannot prove with absolute certainty, but we move forward with trust. And almost, almost all of life is done without that mathematical certainty because it's based on reasonable assumptions. So this demand from some for absolute certainty before I will believe in God is based on a false assumption. We can have faith based on good evidence, but faith by its very nature means we won't have an absolute watertight argument about God this side of heaven. So I thought maybe we could look at what are the sources of our doubt? What, what causes us to doubt? And here we look at what Paul says in the book of Romans. So if you've got a Bible or phone or whatever you look at to access God's word, in Romans chapter 1, this is what Paul says, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of human beings who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. First thing we see from what Paul is saying is there that we doubt because of immorality and self-interest. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of human beings who suppress the truth by the wickedness. So what Paul is saying, for some, atheism, disbelief, is not a result of honest intellectual thinking the answers through and the investigation of scripture or other things. Atheism, rather, he says, is a result of stubborn disobedience. It's not a careful looking at the different questions, but it's actually willful rebellion, Paul says. Now, some might say, well, that's unfair. You're suggesting that for some people, they just do not want there to be a God because it suits their self-interest. But you might know, and I know people who have actually come to this point of saying, I doubt God's existence because it affects the way I live. It interferes with what I would like to do. Let me put it this way. Say I was to meet and bump into Russell Brand. Some of you might know or recognize Russell Brand, being known as an actor, playboy, uh, and um, he's been known in the past for drug addictions and sex addiction and other things. But say, for instance, I bumped into Russell Brand. I actually saw him in Marlow a few weeks ago. But say I went up to him and I said, Russell, can we have a conversation? And he invites me over to his house. I think he lives near Henley. He wants to have a good chat about the Christian faith as opposed to the brand philosophy for life. And after some really good discussions about faith, Russell Brand says to me, Simon, I like what you're saying. You've convinced me that the Christian faith is a better way of living than the Russell brand of life. And I think, wow, 
I'm convincing Russell Brand about the Christian faith. I can't wait to tweet about it. But then he just says, I've got one question for you. If I adopt your Christian philosophy, will I still be able to sleep with any woman that I want to? And I say, well, no, 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 you've not quite got it. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you align yourself to his ways. And what Jesus says and the Bible says is, actually, you're committing yourself to monogamy. One woman to be married for life. And he says, well, that's just what I thought. See yourself out. Someone else, Aldous Huxley, famous author of A Brave New World. He was quite honest in what he said about his objections to the Christian faith, saying they're not primarily intellectual. Here's what he said. He said, I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning. Consequently, I assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in metaphysics. He's also concerned to prove there is no valid reason why he personally should not do what he wants to do. For myself, the philosophy of meaningless was essentially an instrument of liberation sexual and political. In other words, what Huxley is saying is being very honest and very forthright in saying, I took a negative stance towards the Christian faith. Why? Because I had a prior commitment that was more important to me than faith in God. And if I'm honest, I've seen this many times with many people. Not often maybe stated as clearly as that. And maybe I can ask you, maybe for you or for friends that you know, family or otherwise, that maybe the cause of the doubts that you've had is related to a prior commitment than a relationship with Christ. So we could talk all day about evidence and whether God exists and all of these different things, but really your prior commitment to your boyfriend or girlfriend or kids or making money or whatever it is, is actually going to bias you against following God. But at least Huxley was quite honest about his private interests. So he may doubt because of immorality or self-interest. Secondly, we may doubt because of ingratitude. Paul says this in verse 21 of chapter 1. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Let me put it this way by painting a picture of a couple. This is a, based on a true story. I'll call them John and Catherine. They're a young family. John's work was in a mess. He was a financial advisor. Been ripped off by a partner. They were thousands of pounds in debt which threatened to lose their house. And work was tough. Catherine had had an affair with a parent from the same school. Their marriage was on the rocks. They turned up at church, desperate and struggling and in a bad way. But at the church, they encountered God powerfully who met them in a really deep place. Through tears and with pain, God began to bring a measure of healing. They became part of a small group, gathered with others, had mentors who helped and supported them through this tough part of their life. And their life began to turn around. Their marriage issues began to be resolved. John got a new job. His finances began to become on track. Slowly over time, they forgot the help they received from others and what God had done in their life. And they began to drift away from any connection with the church and with God. They didn't feel so desperate to cry out to God in their pain. And because of their contentment, did not return to give thanks to all that God had done. And I see that again and again. And that's a true story that happened here at St. Andrews. See, there are two ways that we might deal with doubt. One is to beat ourselves up. And the other is that we might build our faith with the practice of gratitude. That practice of gratitude. 
So when you've received something, when you just pause in your own life and you just say, Lord God, I'm just so thankful for all that you have given me. So for instance, just this morning, I took one minute just to write down on my phone the things that I was thankful for. And within a minute, I had 22 things listed down that I was thankful for that I could read and say, Lord God, you are so good, the things that you have put into my life. It's when we pause before God and we say, thank you for all that you've done, recognizing there's tough stuff going on around us, but there's so many good things God's given us. Do you think you might build your faith through gratitude? So we can doubt because of self-interest. We can maybe doubt because of ingratitude. And the third thing is that we can doubt because of inadequate foundations. Inadequate foundations. Let me paint you another picture of a young person. Young person grows up in a really great church. The youth work is vibrant. They have wonderful experiences of worship. Maybe they go to new wine with others and they really encounter God through their years as a teenager. Great fun being with other Christians and their parents support them. And then they get to the age of 18, and off they go to university for the first time. They're away from home, away from the support of others around them, their church and their friends and their youth group and parents. And they're by themselves, a Christian young person away at university. And they go to their class, the Introduction to Anthropology. The professor is a bright professor. And he says, everything is culturally relative. There's no ultimate truth. and All life is formed out of purely naturalistic evolution. Any belief in God is really irrational. And being away at university, they feel alone and lonely. So that Christian person knows that they believe and what they believe, but they don't know why they believe. They've never really investigated the reason for their faith. See, at some point in your life, you need to get to that point of why it is that I believe. It's not just enough to know that you believe, but why I believe. A friend of mine, Mark, came on an Alpha course in his mid to late 20s. He began to explore the Christian faith. And after reading about it, thought, I like this. I like what I read about Jesus. I don't want to follow Jesus. But he had loads of questions. How did the Old Testament come into being? What about creation and all this kind of stuff? And he began to read books by C.S. Lewis. He'd listened to podcasts. He'd asked me to help him to work through some of the issues that he had. And what he was doing during that time, he was building pillars into the bedrock of his life to build a foundation for his Christian faith. And over years... That has served him so well. He had reasons for his faith. So friends, you really need to do this. You may not have an intellectual attack at college or whatever, but it might be that someone in your family faces cancer or you lose a family member. There's some crisis that comes your way. And if you're not rooted, those things, those storms can knock you off course and even away from faith. So the Apostle Peter puts it this way. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope that you have. What's the reason for the hope that you have? Do you know why you believe? Have you dug those good foundations so that you can stand the storms of life when they come? And then why do we doubt, lastly, I just want to say this, that we doubt often because of ignorance and indifference. Ignorance and indifference. Paul says, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. I often find that when I'm talking to people about faith, and they say, well, I don't believe in God, there's kind of like a shrug of the shoulders. I've never really been into religion. I've never really been to church. I've never really thought about it that much, but no, God doesn't really mean much to me. Somebody called Lee Strobel's would have described himself like that. He's gone on to write a book called The Case for Christ, which if you are someone who really likes evidence, and wants to look at the evidence for the Christian faith. This is a great book that he's subsequently written. 
but he was in his 20s or 30s, I think, in a state of life where God didn't mean much to him, apart from a shrug of the shoulders. Yeah, I know about God, yeah, but it doesn't have much to do with me at this stage of my life. He was an award-winning journalist. Life was going great. He had a great job and a great family, great house. And interestingly, he described his life this way. He said, it was as if I was driving my sports car down the road. One arm was around my wife, and the other arm was waving at people. I don't know who was driving the car. And everyone was saying, look at the Strobels. Aren't they amazing? What a beautiful young couple. How successful. That approach to life in which I was utterly indifferent to God really worked when the road in front of me was straight and true. But when my life hit a curve, I needed someone whose hand was on the steering wheel. My life hit a curve when my father died. I felt like I was spinning out of control. You see, friends, at some point in your life, you will hit a curve, something unexpected that comes out of left field, a crisis that could be internal, a depression that you just cannot overcome, an addiction that is just too strong for you, or you struggle with anger or anxiety, or there's a relational crisis, a divorce or a separation. Someone breaks your heart. Or it could be the loss of a job or financial problems. But at some point, everybody hits a curve in their life. And it's at this point that the existence of God, whether you can build your life on him, suddenly becomes terribly relevant. That God exists and that God loves you becomes a matter of life and death. So for myself, as a follower of Jesus for 45 years, I've discovered that the best way to deal with the negative things that come into my life, whether it's anxiety or anger or confusion, and especially this stuff about doubt, it's simply to invite Jesus into that negativity. Not to cover it up, not just to put on a good face that everything's going well, but just say, I, I need help with other people around me. I'm not just going to go through this on my own. It's an honest, authentic bringing it before God. And when you do that, I've consistently found that it strengthens my faith. My faith. And I've found that God can handle anything that I throw at him. Because God is good. And I'm going to encourage us this morning to have a chance just to do that. Because I recognize that in all of your lives, there'll be something maybe, maybe small or something big that you are facing and dealing with that maybe is that nagging doubt. And we want to invite God into that place. So can I invite you to stand with me? If I can invite the band up as well, that would be great.